Hi everyone! What's up? I am super happy to be here, mainly because I'm supposed to do this presentation for another conference, so this is, this is, this is awesome. <laughs> but uh, you know, the other conference actually is for physicians. I'm really glad to, to make it for, for the general audience, because I know a lot of you here have gone through a lot of, of things. But uh, we're going to talk about how to make the, to make the brain grow. So, sounds good. So we'll talk about food, we're gonna talk about habits, we'll talk about tactics, just because it rhymes, and I thought it was a cute title. But let's, 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 talk, about, let's talk about the age of, age of neurogenesis. That sounds super cool, right? Neurogenesis. Neuro is, is neurons, or brain cells, or nerve cells, and genesis is um, uh, creation or birth, right? So it's really trying to uh, create uh, new nerve cells, and that's a really sexy approach, right? If, we, if we're talking about uh, something that can help you uh, regrow your brain, regrow your nerves, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a big deal to learn about. And so the old thinking is that if your brain gets damaged, it can't be repaired, right? And so um, the old thinking is that you're, you're born with a set of neurons. And these set of neurons, if it gets damaged throughout your lifetime, you can't grow it back, you just, it just scars over. And then we have to protect uh, uh, what's, what's left over. But the new thinking, um, even back in 2008, looking at mice model from, the, from uh, the Buck Institute, is that you can actually grow back brain cells in these, in these little mice with different tactics. And then we know now that it works in humans as well in 2012. In 2012, they found that the areas of the brain that's responsible for memory uh, can actually grow back. It's called the hippocampus, right? The areas of the brain that was responding to, um, to emotionality, which is the amygdala, can actually also grow, which is very interesting. It's not something that we've seen before in, in, in humans. And we know that the areas responsible for your personality, we call it the frontal lobe, can actually grow back and expand as well. And so um, we live in an environment uh, where there's a lot of insults that we can take on and these insults are things that can inhibit brain cells, but if you know what they are and minimize that in your environment, you can have a lot of success in growing back brain. So, so I mean, if you look at what's going on right now, this is the brain in the public eye, right? You have <clears throat> New York Times bestsellers, you have you know, David Perlmutter here uh, with the book Brain Maker, you have Thomas O'Brien, You Can Fix Your Brain, that's a very recent release. And then uh, the Broken Brain series, with Mark Hyman, that was January of last year. The 2019 um, uh, Broken Brain 2 series has started as, as well. And so everyone's kind of saying very similar things. And even Houston, that's my friend Crystal. Oh, she's not here right now. Uh, Crystal, was this is yesterday, actually. She was on uh, KPRC talking about foods to help grow your brain. And uh, what are some things that can affect brain healing, okay? And so there are things that, there are factors that you can control and there are factors that you may not be able to control. All right. So I want to start with the right column because the, that's a shorter list. The factors you can't control are the genes that you were born with and other people to an extent, right? You think you can control other people, but you can't, right? In terms of habits. So, and so, <clears throat> but the genetics part, actually, we're, we're learning that that may not be true. It may be something that you can control. And this is a study of epigenetics, which well, I'll, I'll get into in a little bit. And then there's factors that you can control. It's a very long list. Food, stress, exercises, environmental toxins, relationships, and how you deal with people, uh, medications, and sleep, and timing of eating. Uh, you guys know what I mean by digital behavior? We're in the, in the world of social media, we have a lot of stimulus at 11 p.m. at nighttime, that blue light, um, uh, stopping our, our melatonin excretion. And then our, our jobs, right? <clears throat> Believe it or not, you can't control your jobs and a lot of my employees are here, don't say otherwise. <laughs> and so, and so the, 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 this column right here on the, uh, on the left side, and these are the factors that actually control the ways our genes are expressed, okay? So we call that study of epigenetics. So I want you to take a look at the cartoon, and the definition of epigenetics is that are really biological changes that allow or disallow gene expression. And so we talk about epigenetics and try to optimize epigenetics in lifestyle medicine. And so if you look at the top, you have microwaves, you have paper and receipts there, you have canned foods. And a lot of these can create different, um, 
different triggers uh, in our DNA expression, in our gene expression. And so uh, if you look at the cartoon at the bottom, so that double helix over here is, is the DNA and there's a little stop sign and there's actually uh, molecular signals that tell our, our, our genes to, to produce protein or stop and uh, tell our DNA is to transcribe into RNA. And these are, the, these are the, basically the language of how we express our genes. So we are born with our certain set of genes, but can we control, uh, can we control at least in some part to figure out which genes do we really want to express and which genes we want to hold back? And this may sound complicated, but it's not. And I'll give you an example. Who's drinking juice right now? Okay, okay. All right, so I'll give you an example. So in that juice, when, what's in that juice? So uh, dandelion root, I assume? Kale, collard greens, okay. Celery, cucumber, okay. Beets, turmeric, okay. So you have the turmeric that's there that upregulates uh, th this, uh, this gene that, that uh, produces something called nitric oxide synthase, which produces nitric oxide, which makes sure your blood vessels can dilate nicely, and your brain can be perfused, and we want that to be upregulated, uh, especially people after strokes or traumatic brain injury. Uh, beets do the same thing. Beets probably upregulate nitric oxide more than any, anything else. Um, why? Because it's purple. What makes the beets purple? Something called anthocyanin. And this is uh, part of what's called a polyphenol complex. And, uh, and these things are actually molecular signaling markers to tell our DNA to do certain things. And then what, collard greens and what else? Uh, Kale, dandelion root? Kale, yeah. so, so all three have sulforaphanes. And sulforaphanes, sulforaphanes, sulforaphanes uh, are components that your body needs to detoxify. And so your liver does a really good job detoxifying from things. And so, and so these are the components that are changing your molecular signaling and DNA expression every single second. So when you drink that juice, a lot of that is happening into your body right away. It's pretty fast too. And so that's why you have underlying, underlying mechanisms in your body to protect you from certain things to happen. And the really, another really good example of when this goes awry, and I'm sure you guys have heard of cancer, right? Uh, cancer, so what is cancer? What is cancer? It's cells that start dividing and they don't stop, right? For the cells to start to, to divide, they don't stop, they require this guy right here called a stop codon, right? To stop, stop uh, generating these, this tissue. And there, we know that there are things that are, that are in the environment that will bind to the stop codon, take it away, and it'll just continue to divide. So what are those things? So there's, there's things like heavy metals, right? Mercury and arsenic, cadmium, aluminum. We know there are things um, that are byproduct of, of, of industry and uh, petroleum engineering. Uh, we know there's things that are something called bisphenol A, BPA, heavily related with prostate cancer and breast cancer. We know there's things like styrene from styrofoam. And believe it or not, in our practice, we check for these things in people's urine and they exist there. And it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty remarkable in what quantities and we're able to see that the higher toxic load they have, the worse autoimmune disease or the worse uh, dementia or the more delayed, um, delayed recovery from any chronic disease that they actually have. And so this is what epigenetics really is. And, um, and this is something that we have complete control over, but it's very difficult to talk about from, from, a, from a physician um, just because there's so many different components to it. But I'll talk about it tonight. So you don't have to eat brain to grow brain. So, you know, I, I used to think that, uh, I forgot what movie I was watching. It's a zombie movie and these zombies really were like starving for brain and they want to eat it because they want to grow their, more, uh, their own brain. Um, I don't know what movie it was. This was back in China when I was born. And so, you know, don't quote me on, on what movie it is. But, you know, there's things in life we control and the things in, things in life we cannot control, but we can always control what goes into our mouths, right? We can agree on that. We can always control what goes into our mouths. And so that's not a brain, it's a walnut. You guys, you guys are, in case you guys are wondering. So I'm gonna talk about food first. Um, okay, oh, do you see that one, dark chocolate? I'll talk about that next. I'm gonna talk about food first, okay? And uh, I, I start with omega-3s um, because most people will know what omega-3s are. 
So omega, th there's, there's, there's different types of fats. There's omega-3s, omega-7s, omega-9s, omega-10s, omega-6s. And we know that specifically omega-3s can be anti-inflammatory. It means that it can reduce inflammation. It can help the brain, uh, the brain grow. It can help um, reduce autoimmune issues. Uh, but, and uh, it's required for everywhere in our body. And uh, there's high concentration of omega-3 in, in fatty tissue in our body. And our brain is actually very fatty tissue. But it's, it's more than just fish. And if you are eating fish and you're eating farm-raised salmon, actually there's not a whole lot of omega-3s in farm-raised salmon. It's actually wild-caught salmon that, that it is, uh, mackerel, cod, liver oil. Um, but what about some other sources? So we have some vegans in our practice. So what are some vegan sources? Well, there's flax seeds, there's chia seeds, walnuts, some soybeans, and hemp seeds that have, uh, that have great content of omega-3. So um, in our practice, we check something called an omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. So we can figure out what the best ratio is for you by looking at your omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. We can further break it down by the different types of omega-3s, and that's how scientific we can get. And if someone came to my office with any sort of brain injury, that is the first thing that we look at. What is your omega-3 to omega-6 balance? If you have a really high omega-6 to omega-3 balance, we're like, well, let's talk about the diet. Let's, let's see what we can do about that, because that's going to be more powerful than any medication. And so... <clears throat> While omega-3s are important, uh, I, I put in dark chocolate. I'm, I'm personally not a chocolate fan, but my wife was sitting next to me. She's like, you talk about chocolate? I'll talk about chocolate. And the reason I talk about chocolate, because we, we learned a lot of lessons from chocolate. So most people think chocolate is, uh, well, we all know that chocolate is a treat, right? And so when people eat chocolate, you feel good. Like, why do you think people feel good when they eat chocolate? And so chalk, there's many reasons. It's, uh, it acts on opioid receptors, which means it's a natural painkiller. Uh, you can't overdose on it, so that's kind of nice, right? It behaves like a cannabinoid, um, which means that it, it hits uh, uh, your cannabinoid receptors, which helps with immune regulation, pain modulation. It has tons of tryptophan. Uh, tryptophan is my favorite topic of all time because tryptophan is what's needed for your body to make the happy neurotransmitter serotonin. And then serotonin turns into melatonin, which makes you sleep. And so uh, people who have issues sleeping tend to have uh, issues with depression and anxiety, right? And it's because of this tryptophan pathway is inhibited in one way or another. It could be from diet, it could be from uh, external causes, it could be from environmental causes. Uh, but in dark chocolate, there's tons of tryptophan. So people feel good when they eat chocolate, right? They feel, they feel good. Um, so why dark chocolate? Why do you think dark chocolate? Because what's, what's the part of chocolate that's, that's not dark? It's, it's milk and cream and sugar, right? That's all it is, right? And so we like dark chocolate because there's a lot, a lot of uh, uh, cacao uh, content and has, it has its own uh, good properties as well. Um, so chocolate has been studied a lot. And uh, in a lot of different cultures, chocolate is not sweet, right? You guys are familiar with mole, right? Mole. Uh, in Mexican and Spanish cultures, there's different types of mole, and mole will combine with bright colored peppers like cayenne pepper and some other peppers I can't pronounce. Um, when they are combined, they're seen to have a synergistic effect in helping people heal the brain. Now, how does that work? And so it's because that type of chocolate uh, is stimulating these, these, these receptors, helping that tryptophan, helping that brain starts the reconnection process at a very high level. Uh, and then you add in something that's brightly colored, that brightly colored substance, uh, if it's cayenne, it's red, right? So that red is from another form of, uh, of, uh, of uh, polyphenol called anthocyanin. And so that red mixed along with that chocolate, the deep dark chocolate cacao, those are colors that we want to consume in our body, but make sure it's not artificial like Skittles, uh, make sure that it exists in nature, right? And so what about coffee? What's the verdict on coffee these days? Joe loves coffee. <laughs> so what's the verdict on coffee these days? So coffee is very controversial, and I'm going to get into why. And um, so we know, we know that coffee can be abused, correct? Okay, but did you know that the abuse of coffee has nothing to do with the caffeine content? Did you guys know that? All right. So, so this is surprising for people, because mainly because... We know that caffeine can actually be beneficial, um, which is actually two slides over, okay. 
So we know that caffeine can actually be beneficial, but if we look at coffee as, as a whole. So what is coffee? Coffee comes from a plant, right? And in this plant, there's a bean. And in this bean, um, it's very similar uh, chemical content to chocolate, actually, where you have a lot of polyphenols, antioxidants, and all these things that, that are really good for the brain, right? So what happens to coffee between the bean and then Sam's or Walmart or wherever you go? What, what happens in between? This is the process that makes coffee now so great. And if you ever get a headache from coffee, it's not the caffeine, it's the actual coffee. And because what we know is that coffee is one of the dirtiest things you can actually consume if it's not processed right, okay? And so um, there's tons of studies that are done on this, over 250 different brands of coffee. Um, so coffee is, uh, is, has a lot of um, byproducts of processing that are in it. Coffee, if you ever leave coffee beans out for about two hours, you see mold growing on it, right? Anybody done this? If anybody do, do fresh coffee beans and use it as a fertilizer like we do, we will save it. But about two hours later, you'll see mold growing on it like pretty fast. And But that, that's good fertilizer for us, right? Um, but it's not something we necessarily want in our body. So if you have coffee beans just kind of laying there, open. And my best example is looking at coffee beans that are, you know, the freshly ground coffee beans that you get, right, in the stores? And they're, they're, just, they're just in this bucket and you grind them and you think you're doing yourself a favor. What happens is the longer they sit there, uh, the more mold spores can get on there, the more oxidizing can get. And oxidation actually deteriorates the antioxidant properties of coffee. And so um, we, in, in my practice, we use, we actually use this brand, Purity Coffee, because um, they're actually passionate and they actually do third party testing on the, on the toxicity, uh, toxicity testing, mold testing, heavy metal testing on the different coffee components. So there's two brands that really do that. I know of one's Purity, the other one's Bulletproof Coffee. Uh, those two brands are, are very passionate about, about, uh, about clean coffee. And then it's not the, when you buy it and then you bring it home, the last thing you want to do is leave it open out in the air because I just told you it grows mold after a couple of hours, right? And so you want to make sure you, you, you bring it to the house. You um, and don't leave it out in like Amazon or anything like that <laughs> on the outside. Bring it into the house, put it into an air, uh, airtight container and just stick it in the freezer. It actually helps, works very well. So the brand matters, the packaging matters. On the back of this packaging is a, is a one-way valve. Air can go out, no air can go in. When I brought this back from New York, it was, it was uh, checked in. And so it was uh, not in a pressurized cabin because it was in the luggage compartment. So when I got it back from New York, it was all shrunken and I can't pull it out. I was like, man, that thing works really well. But that's what you want with coffee because coffee can be toxic once it's exposed to the air and so can other things like uh, uh, flax seeds. So never buy pre-ground flax seeds, always grab it yourself. And when you buy coffee, make sure, make sure you know what brand to get. So, uh, organic, why does organic matter? Anybody know? Huh? Yeah, pesticides. And so we find pesticides in urine all the time. We do this thing called a glyphosate urine test and we find uh, organophosphates and pesticides in urine all the time. And uh, that's definitely not good for the brain because those are direct uh, relationship with neurological damage and decreased brain healing. And so, but that's the skinny on coffee. Coffee is great um, if you get it from the right source. Plus, um, if you get it from a real good source, mold-free packaging, when you drink the coffee, you don't get a headache. You feel like, you feel pretty lively and it lasts for a very long time. Our patients in the waiting room love it, right? Yeah. It's like, what do I buy this? It's delicious. Yeah, yes, two seconds is gone. Uh, green tea. So green tea is one of my favorite things, not only because I'm Chinese, but also because it has one of my favorite components for brain health, and it's EGCG, and I'm not gonna uh, pronounce it because I can't, but ECGC has been shown to protect the brain on uh, many different levels. The antioxidants uh, helps take away oxygen radicals, which really deteriorate the brain. It's a polyphenol, it's just like the coffee and chocolate I talked about. It also helps uh, prevent uh, brain death cells and a lot of dementia studies. Polyphenols, I should also uh, should say it's in a lot of ischemic stroke studies as well, has been very beneficial. L-theanine. L-theanine um, is another one of my favorite components. So L-theanine is, uh, is a component that helps uh, neurotransmitter regulation. It helps us make uh, this neurotransmitter that calms us down called GABA. And GABA is one of my favorite neurotransmitters because if we take some L-theanine, some polyphenols, it makes you feel pretty good. Um, and, and it's got caffeine in it, but caffeine 
Although in stimulants, in small doses, it actually helps with working memory. So they looked at the molecular model of mice and what happens when they take caffeine, and they found that through certain pathways, you can actually activate hippocampal cells, which are cells that, that, uh, that help with working memory. So green tea, by the way, I should have a slide on this. Green tea should also not be exposed to the air, just like coffee. Uh, make sure it's vacuum packaged from a good source. A lot of green tea from different areas of the world are, are, can be contaminated with arsenic uh, and mercury. So you gotta be careful at what sources you get. Um, but uh, it's, uh, for, the, for the most part, it's, it's, it's quite good. <clears throat> All right, so I talked about caffeine a lot, right? So these are actual journals. This was a doctor's slide, but I decided to leave it in here. So these are actually journals uh, looking at caffeine as protective factors in different diseases. So caffeine protects against dementia, Alzheimer's disease, even decaffeinated coffee, which also has caffeine in it, which is a small amount, uh, prevents scopolamine-induced memory impairment in rats. These poor rats are given this thing called scopolamine-induced memory impairment. This is actually the reverse portion of it. Uh, therapeutic uh, uh, levels of caffeine in Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders uh, can be very beneficial. And, it's, and most of the studies, is about, it's about a cup of, of, of coffee worth of caffeine. It's the 150, 200 milligrams uh, are looking at the protective studies. However, I do want to point out the fourth bullet point, it's in bold, that not all caffeine is great. So these studies that were done in the first three were, co were caffeine and coffee, but uh, there's three major studies, and this is probably the biggest one uh, out of stroke in 2013, that the use of caffeine-containing medicines increases chances of hemorrhagic strokes. Okay, so what is the most common caffeine-containing medicine in anybody who has strokes before? It's these headaches medicines, right? Excedrin. Yeah, Excedrin, migraine. Uh, actually, that's what they studied in this, in this particular study, okay? So you gotta be real careful, you gotta be real careful. Uh, people with a lot of neurologic damage can have chronic migraines, uh, but they're, if they're using high amounts of caffeine-containing medicines, in our practice, we try to taper them off, and the way we actually try to taper them off is load them up with that green tea, and load, uh, the ECG, ECGCG and green tea, we load up with other different polyphenols to help uh, mitigate that effect to, to detox them, and uh, we're actually pretty successful after that. And if they're, if they're drinking not a, such a great brand of coffee, um, then we kind of switch them to a, to a non-toxic coffee that's third-party tested. Like I said, there's only two brands that I know of, which is Purity Coffee and Bulletproof Coffee, and they do remarkably well because no one wants to give up coffee especially Jill. All right, so let's talk about berries, man. Berries, is, berries, is, berries are something that was new to me uh, because I never really liked berries until I was seven years old because um, I wasn't really exposed to them because uh, I came to China when I was seven. And so berries are interesting. So there is a movement out there called the ketogenic diet or keto, right? And keto is very anti-berries for, for a lot of people because we have people come into our office uh, really saying that I really don't want to touch the berry component to it, but uh, but the berries are actually fantastic They have a they have anthocyanin and I mentioned this earlier when I talked about beets as well uh, it Gives it a, this rich blue color. It could be purple it could be fuchsia a deep red and cherry the purple and pomegranate and these are these are natural components in Nature that we consume to help detox the body and to help protect the brain cells um, but we will also want to make sure that we want to buy organic. So why organic? Once again, you want to decrease the amount of pesticides coming in. And these pesticides, a lot of them really negate the beneficial effect of these deep, uh, dark colored berries. And so I, I don't think it's a surprise that plants are good for you in general. <clears throat> and so we have people eat a lot of plants um, for different conditions and disease states. But especially in talking about the brain, we require our patients to eat, uh, we say nine to 11, but I write nine to 13 just because that was done on the previous study. Nine to 13 uh, servings of plant foods every day. Um, a french fry is not a plant, so we'll have to make sure that they understand that. Um, uh, speaking of french fries, I didn't put this in the slide. Okay, so if you have anything that's good, like a berry or, or, or sweet potatoes or uh, any starches, and you put it into a deep fryer, it defeats the purpose. Um, so you're just like, dang. It defeats the purpose of the beneficial effect of the food. Why is that? So the, the reason is, is multifold. One, when high temperature is, is, uh, is placed upon a carbohydrate, 
um, there are different chemical properties that can happen to it. Number two, it depends on the oil that you're frying in. There's, uh, there's, uh, if you're, most of the prepackaged foods in the U.S. is fried in, in soybean oil or vegetable oil. In actuality, there's no difference between soybean oil and vegetable oil. It depends on how they label it. Vegetable oil is 97% soybean oil. The problem with the soybean oil is that we know that the, the source of most soy beans in America, not in the world, but in America, comes from a very particular strain that was engineered to, uh, to grow very fast and resist pesticides, okay? And so that type of soy can have some detrimental uh, responses, but when they make an oil out of it, if you fry it into the soybean oil, what happens is the oil gets packaged and they all are packaged in clear containers, right? Right, so if they're packaged in clear containers, sunlight hits it, it oxidizes the whole thing, which means now you have a rancid oil and they've done studies where they show that um, most oils that are in large supermarkets uh, are oxidized because they're actually in, in clear containers. And these oxidation creates tons of oxygen radicals and these radicals then start damaging these brain cells. And so how do we combat that? The dark color and berries I told you about, uh, the, the, the good quality plants. And so that's why we really like uh, promoting, uh, promoting plants um, in our practice. And so I tell people aim for three to four servings of plant foods at every meal, even breakfast. Some people think I'm crazy for eating plants for breakfast, but that's how the rest of the world eats. And later I'm gonna show you um, the world's lunch, school lunches compared to America. You guys will love that. And you wanna eat from the, every color of the rainbow. So speaking of the rainbow, so um, a little quick quiz. What, what's the picture on the top right? Yeah, goji berries, goji berries. What about the middle? Other than strawberries, yeah, rhubarb. And the bottom, persimmons. All right, these are my favorite foods growing up. And so when we promote eating colors of the rainbow, we're really trying to capture different, uh, different uh, chemical components in plants. And these chemical components in plants give us a protective factor. And you really want to cycle the colors you eat every day. So, you know, don't eat red just every day for like a month. You know, you have to really cycle through. Um, I like red and deep purples and everything like that, just because that once again the anthocyanin has, has been the most has been the most studied to show to have the best benefit. But even yellow and green. So what's the top right there? Star fruit. Yeah, star fruit. And the bottom, of course, is mixed greens, right? And so uh, and even yellow and green and uh, yellow. There's a lot of different things. Of course, star fruit's one of them. Succotash, summer squash, Asian pears. And green has a whole lot longer list than what I'm showing here. Um, but uh, that's, these are the components you really want to mix into your, to your daily life. Uh, purple, uh, we started switching to uh, purple cauliflower not too long ago because it has been shown to be fantastic at brain health. Uh, and then white, tan, or brown. So people will say, hey, I really want to avoid white foods. Well, there's some that are good for you. White cauliflower flour is, is phenomenal. Um, excuse me. And then tan and brown, I really like to use dates as an example. Dates have tons of polyphenols, even though it's, it's brown, tons of polyphenols, uh, because when, when uh, dates are not dried, um, they actually deep purple as well. Uh, jicama. Jicama is um, one of the things I said that if you are trying to avoid f white foods, don't avoid jicama. So why jicama? Jicama is one of the best prebiotics you can, you can eat. And prebiotic means something that's very fibrous that feeds the good bacteria in your gut. And jicama has been, has been shown, studied actually to protect uh, testosterone decrease in men. So very, very interesting, um, which is not surprising at all. Uh, ginger is great, mushrooms, nuts, pears, sauerkraut, shallots, uh, soy, tahini, tea, and whole grains. And so uh, when I say whole grains, there's a big asterisk there. Um, I'm not a big fan of wheat in general in the U.S. because most of the strains of wheat is hybridized in the 1950s to resist uh, pesticides. And so that's why when people, a lot of our patients, when they eat wheat in the U.S., they don't feel so good. When they go to Italy, they eat wheat and they're fine, right? Completely different strains. And the, uh, the pesticides that are contained in the wheat in the U.S. is illegal in Europe. So just know that as well. Like I said, if you ever wonder if it's in your body, we can check for it in the urine. It takes about three weeks and you pee in a cup and you can see, find all these pesticides in there. So I talked about earlier eating organic, does it really matter? So why does it really matter? And here, this is what the data suggests. So, you know, in, 
in September, I'm, I'm speaking at an autism conference, and uh, one of the things that we, we talk about is how important is uh, eating organic in anybody with any brain issues. So autism is one of them, chronic seizures, traumatic brain injury, uh, hemorrhagic or ischemic strokes. And it's, it's very important because we know that um, there's one class of, uh, of uh, pesticides, which is the most common class, called organophosphates, and glyphosate is the type of organophosphate. These are linked to a lot of brain degeneration, worsening al autism, Alzheimer's, and poor recovery from stroke and permanent nerve damages. And uh, everyone tries to have a safe level. And what's interesting in the US is that, um, you know, the, we know that this is toxic, but we still want to give a safe level to it. And that with organophosphates, they were never able to determine a safe level. Um, but, you know, if you look at the news, yes, there's a safe level of lead or safe level of arsenic. Um, which, you know, that's, that's very controversial. But organophosphates, everyone has agreed, there's actually no safe level, um, but we find it in people's urine. And it's not just in foods, in golf courses, uh, pet flea treatments, mosquito sprays, and inside schools as well. And so these are, the, these are the components that can really damage the brain and prevent brain healing. And organophosphates um, are uh, now, um, linked to uh, autoimmune neurological disorders, uh, particularly multiple sclerosis and Lou Gehrig's disease as well. So, all right, this is my favorite part. So, uh, in the U.S., uh, these, are, these, are, these are school lunches, right? And if, you look, if you look at France, and this is, this is a phenomenon that I really want someone to explain to me. So, in the United States, if, we, if I go to a restaurant, why is the kids' menu so terrible and the regular menu is so awesome, <laughs> right? So uh, I would think that you want to want to feed your kids something better than you're feeding yourself. That's that's why I assume. But that's kind of like the culture, right? <clears throat> and so if we look at the school lunches, let's let's critique uh, the USA versus France right here. So uh, what do we see? Chicken is that chicken nuggets? Yeah, chicken nuggets, ketchup, probably high high fructose corn syrup, um, instant mashed potatoes. Yeah, uh, peas, uh, probably. Uh, a fruit cup with even more high fructose corn syrup. Yeah, so a lot of carbs, a lot of sugar, a lot of processed sugar, right? And even the chicken nugget in the powder itself probably has a processed sugar. And the instant mashed potatoes is probably only 50% potato, to be honest with you, <laughs> right? And then you have the ketchup, right? Um, but let's, let's compare it to France, where you have nice that polyphenols right there in the bottom left. You have green beans, you have a cut up kiwi. Um, I think those are carrots in the, in the middle right there. You have a slice of meat and you have apples and you have brie cheese, right? That looks delicious. I mean, I would eat that. I would steal my kids' food if I was in France, right? But I would probably avoid the, the one on the left. Let's look at Ukraine. Um, the deep, rich purple right there are a, a plant-based and we know it's because it's purple, it's got plenty of anthocyanins. So what do we know about anthocyanins? If our kids eat it, it helps the brain adapt to, uh, to stress where you have the serotonin, we call it the serotonin and the glutamate balance. And uh, you have, um, I think those are fermented cabbages of some type of sauerkraut. So you have uh, prebiotics in, in, the, in the cabbage and probiotics that are because it's fermented, that's healing the gut. And there's a huge gut brain connection uh, going on. And then uh, you have some sausage and I think there are potatoes underneath, but I'm sure they're not instant potatoes because I don't think they have those in Ukraine. And then that, uh, that piece of tortilla looking thing is actually a whole grain uh, crepe-like thing. So it's pretty good. And let's look at Spain. Spain is probably one of my favorites because um, you have, uh, you have some, some shrimp right there. It looks really pretty. I mean, their school lunches are so awesome. But once again, there's a lot of color here, right? They have a lot of the colors of the rainbows that we really want. If you look at Italy, that's where, that's where Mia's from. Right? If you look at Italy, uh, you, have, you have, I guess, penne on the bottom left and you have... Um, you have uh, uh, mixed greens and probably a piece of fish. Um, you have uh, sourdough right there, which is also fermented. It's a great prebiotic. Um, and then you have some cherry tomatoes and, and some grapes. That's fantastic. You have all the colors of the rainbow right there. It's really, it's really great. Uh, Finland, um, once again, very, very colorful things. You have soups and the carrots and beets. And like I said, beets help upregulate that nitric oxide. Um, that helps your blood vessels dilate and you can perfuse your brain. It's uh, beat's been shown to be very beneficial in, in, the, in the one month post stroke. And then you have, look at Brazil and South Korea. 
we're getting more and more colorful here, right? We're getting more and more colorful. We're seeing all spectrums of the rainbow that occur naturally and nothing is processed. And so, the, I mean, this is what we see in school lunches and you have grease uh, that looks like that. I really love the, uh, the, the, the vine ripen, I'm not sure what that is, is that lime or lemon, maybe? It's vine ripen something, orange or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and then, so, I mean, we have to think about what our plate looks like and what our kids' plates look like. The reason I'm showing you guys this is because this is directly affecting uh, brain health, right? So U.S. has the highest rates of attention deficit disorder, uh, autism, uh, early depression and anxiety in children, um, traumatic stress disorders, um, adjustment disorder in children. So, so <clears throat> there's a very big gut-brain connection that we have to recognize and the foods that we eat control the health of our brain of directly. It's more powerful than medicine, right? All right. And so I get this question a lot in the practice, like, you know, there's a whole lot of diets out there. What's, what's for me? Should I go keto, doc? Should I go paleo? Should I go vegan? Should I do the Atkins diet, carnivore diet, which is really strange to me, and then Whole30, right? And so, so which, which diet is best for me? And this is really hard for a lot of physicians to look at because there's just so much data out there. But most of the data is really YouTube stars and Instagram stars rather than looking at actual data. And so... Um, I'm going to actually go through these and tell you the actual, actual data that's behind this, okay? So ketogenic diet has been the most extensively studied type of diet after traumatic brain injury and a stroke, okay? So the ketogenic diet, if you guys don't know what that is, it's a type of diet to induce the body to burn ketones instead of carbohydrates, which means that um, it's very low on starchy carbohydrates or sweet carbohydrates. It's very high in fat usually. Um, but, and, uh, and the idea is to get your body to, to, to burn these ketones as energy. And we know, we know that mild ketosis uh, allows the brain to be much more efficient in producing ATP, which is energy, right? But it doesn't happen when you go into extreme ketosis. And that's, that's very interesting. And so these are, these are things that are studied, once again, Buck Institute uh, in California, where they looked at mice model where they studied how much neurons they can actually regenerate. And the first dietary studies on animals were actually done on the ketogenic diet in mice. And uh, they found a really, really positive results. And then they started looking at ketogenic diet in the military. Uh, about six years ago, they started doing that. And th these, these people in the military were doing fabulous with the ketogenic diet. They actually had blood markers that improved, the performance improved as well. And then they looked at hemorrhagic stroke. All right, hemorrhagic stroke and ketogenic diet was probably the very first talked about uh, entity that connected ketogenic diet with brain health. And so they found that these people had improvement um, in, uh, in physical ability. They had improvement in cognition scores. They had improvement in reaction time, processing time. And, and so what they really got out of that is that the longer people are in, in ketogenic diet, um, the more benefit that they get. And they, 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 took the study out to about uh, three, three months, actually, is the longest study that was done on this. And so the ketogenic diet is, is good, but most people do keto wrong, right? And I would say, gosh, 90%, Amy, 90% do, pe do, do keto? Everyone. Everyone's? Unless you're yeah, so we like to do what's going to call supervised keto. Um, so ketogenic diet, so if you actually look up ketogenic diet, the first thing that you're going to see on Pinterest is bacon, all right? So, so, um, so bacon should never be part of the ketogenic diet. Bacon actually can throw you out of ketosis because when protein is cooked in high fats, it turns into something called advanced glycation end products, which behaves just like sugar, but it's not sugar. You can't use it as energy and it stimulates insulin to be excreted and it progresses towards diabetes 10 times faster than regular sugar. Okay. So, um, I don't promote bacon. I don't promote any sort of high temperature cooked fats. And then the second thing that you looked at the ketogenic diet is some sort of heavy cream or sour cream or something like that, right? So there's a whole ton of dairy that's in there. 40% uh, of the people in the population can't handle dairy. 60% of the population with irritable bowel syndrome can't handle uh, beta casein, which is a protein that's found in dairy that has nothing to do with lactose intolerance. And uh, this actually creates a whole lot of inflammation. So a lot of people come to us with a ketogenic diet, say it's not working. We switch it up a little bit, get rid of the high temperature cook, cooked uh, um, meats, get rid of the dairy and throw in a ton of vegetables. And my instruction for them is vegetables are not part of your carb count in a ketogenic diet because most people are trying to get below 50 grams of carbs on a ketogenic diet. 
And, but once they go to this modified keto, they do phenomenally well. So um, Carl's here, so I have to mention Carl. Um, so, and uh, Carl's a big fan of this book called The End of Alzheimer's by Dr. Dale Bredesen. And uh, in that book, it talked about a mild ketosis, right? And it also talked about not counting the leafy greens as part of the carb count, right? And what they found in the Buck Institute in, in humans is that uh, people's cognition scores also improved. They were showing that brain growth can occur in the frontal lobe up to 40% and in the hippocampus up to 23% after a year of a mild ketogenic diet with high amounts of, high amounts of, uh, of vegetables. And uh, what Carl doesn't know is about they're about to publish uh, the current data for 2019, which I can't tell you about because it's not published yet, but uh, we're, we're part of that data, uh, data set. And then paleo, you guys know what paleo is? Eating like the Paleolithic times and eating like you're a caveman or cavewoman, right? It's a, it's a diet to mimic the ancient ways of eating. So really want, they, there's not a whole lot of processed foods. There's, uh, there's vegetables, um, no, no, no processed grains or grains uh, for the most part. Um, it sounds really good, but people also do paleo wrong uh, because they generally have a really high omega-6 um, content, meaning a lot, of, a lot of meats and stuff. The problem with the paleo is that they throw their omega-3s out of balance, and we have found that paleo can trigger cholesterol genes to be expressed. Um, so we have some people who are plant-based diet, and then they, they, they want to do a triathlon, they go full paleo for a year, and their cholesterol can triple. The total cholesterol can actually triple because they actually started expressing genes called these hypercholesterolemia genes um, that were within them, but things, the foods that were in the paleo diet trigger that to express, all of a sudden their cholesterol just jumps straight up. Uh, vegan, diet, uh, vegan diets are eating plants only without any products made from animals. Vegan diets, most people can tolerate a vegan diet, but some people do not have the genetics to, to tolerate a vegan diet. And there are specific genes that disallow you to, uh, to activate certain amino acids, uh, specifically L-carnitine. And uh, this can actually make a lot of people very sick. But for the most part, uh, going vegan is, is great. Uh, but you really have to listen to your body. There's no diet for everyone, by the way. It's that you have to listen to your body. Atkins diet is very similar to uh, the, the high fat, low carb content of a ketogenic diet. Atkins diet is pretty much a ketogenic diet because the, the first stage of Atkins diet is, is, uh, is getting the carbs down to a certain milligram, it's 100 milligrams, and then you go 50 and then 25. So Atkins diet was really the first diet to really start talking about the ketosis factor, but it was not called a ketogenic diet. And the carnivore diet and the Whole30 diet is kind of opposite. So I'll talk about the carnivore diet. Have anybody heard of the carnivore diet except my team? Yeah, so carnivore diet is very interesting. So the carnivore diet ha uh, started in the autoimmune population, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus population, where uh, even a lot of people who were vegan, they went, just went complete ate meats and they felt a whole lot better, okay? And so for a period of time. So what happens during the carnivore diet is they, they only eat meat, they don't have any plants. And why do these people with autoimmune issues get better? Is because they went from one extreme to the other extreme. They went from eating a whole lot of plants, and these plants have specific proteins called lectins that make it trigger some autoimmune diseases, and then they take away all that out, and then their, their triggers decrease, and then they go onto this carnivore diet, and they feel a thousand times better. Three months later, they feel terrible, and then they're stuck, right? And then what we try to do is we try to have a combination. We kind of switch them to a combination of plant-based and paleo, um, and that really need that balance is because they probably don't have the genotypes or the gene expressions to, to tolerate uh, either type of diet. So a balance is, is really key. And so, um, and so the Whole30, uh, that's probably my favorite, I think. It's really easy because there's so many recipes online. Uh, it's created by uh, Melissa Hartwig and it's focused on eating just clean whole foods. Um, it's, very, it's, it's very paleo, uh, but at the same time, it's very plant-based uh, plant as well. And so, you know, about the diets, which diet is best for me? I probably would just avoid the carnivore diet, but if you want to try some of these other ones, it really depends on how you feel. My favorite one's probably Whole30 Whole and the mild ketogenic diet. And so, in terms of data, after stroke, after hemorrhages, after traumatic brain injury, the only data that we have that shows a significant improvement is a mild ketogenic diet. So, and this is something that I learned. Uh, one of my first patients, I 
I had in my, uh, when I was, went to private practice, she was a police officer and she uh, she fell off a horse and had really bad brain hemorrhage. She was in the ICU for a long time. Uh, she came out and uh, about a month and a half in, she was suffering terrible migraines, was just eating Tylenol and Excedrin and stuff like that. And so after she, I advised her to go ketogenic, uh, within about a week, she got off all her medicines, she felt a whole lot better. And she actually stayed ketogenic for a year and a half and, uh, and did really well. And so that's where I got real passionate about just the dietary side of medicine and brain health. But that was back in 2013. Okay, what about fasting techniques? Okay. Are there fasting techniques that help the brain grow? And the answer is yes. And uh, not all of these help the brain grow, brain, the brain grow by the way. Um, but um, I'm, I'll start with my favorite one, which is actually the last one on the list, called the circadian rhythm diet. The circadian rhythm diet is how people normally eat. Um, when the sun is out, you eat. When the sun is not out, you don't eat. Okay, it's after sundown. And so eating only when there's sunlight outside. And the reason for this is because of this uh, the circadian rhythm right here. Okay, so the circadian rhythm we know has to do with sleep and wakefulness response, right? And there's two hormones that are opposite of each other. So in the morning time, you have a, you have a surge of cortisol, which is your stress hormone, which allows you to function. And, you're, you're, uh, and that, that cortisol, uh, over time, it kind of drops down a little in the afternoon. And then towards sundown, the minute that there's sundown, your melatonin starts to rise. So what inhibits this, this melatonin curve that's right here? Are you know, looking at cell phones and iPads and TV late at night, you know, TV in the bedroom. It actually inhibits that, that curve, so your circadian rhythm is off. But did you know that eating also deteriorates that curve? So what we have a lot of people do is actually eating only where there's daylight outside, and then all of a sudden the hormone levels are normal without taking any drugs or supplements or anything like that within about a week, and they feel a whole lot better. And it's because when, when you put food into the stomach, it starts a digestive process and an entire cascade uh, to, uh, to deteriorate from, from melatonin excretion. And so melatonin has, uh, has been shown, by taking melatonin at nighttime, uh, it has been shown to improve uh, uh, recovery from stroke and memory and everything like that. And not only that, melatonin, and this is fascinating to me because I didn't know this till a couple years ago, melatonin can help you prevent acid reflux. So how does that work? Why does melatonin help you prevent acid reflux? And the reason is melatonin is your nighttime hormone, right? When it goes up, the last thing you want to do is excrete stomach acid for digestion, right? And so when the melatonin goes up, you're, you, have a, you have a sphincter right here called the low esophageal sphincter that tightens up, it prevents the acid reflux. And so we sometimes use melatonin therapy for acid reflux, but it's part of a natural physiological response. But what happens if you switch that person to a circadian rhythm diet when they, when they stop eating after sundown? That response happens naturally. So what happens if you tell them to stop looking at your iPad or iPhone or turn your, your iPhone to night mode where the color temperature is actually much, much more on the red side rather than blue, because blue uh, inhibits the melatonin release, and that becomes better as well. And so when we talk about the circadian rhythm, it's affecting every portion of our health, doesn't matter what disease it is, and especially brain health. Why? Because we know people with sleep disorders progress to Alzheimer's dementia significantly faster. Most often we're talking about sleep apnea. And so that's why the, the circadian rhythm fasting is probably my favorite way of eating. And then there's alternate day fasting where you eat one day and don't eat another day. And then there is a fasting mimicking diet, which is another one of my favorites. There's prolonged fasting, which is fasting from 24 to 72 hours, and sometimes somebody did it for 28 days. And the intermittent fasting is really popular, especially among the paleo crew, uh, where they're fasting for 16 hours a day and eating for eight hours a day. Uh, as great as intermittent fasting is for a lot of people, there's not a whole lot of data that supports brain health. There's some, but there's not a whole lot of data. There's a few animal studies that compared intermittent fasting to circadian rhythm fasting, to fasting mimicking diet, to alternate day fasting, head to head in animal model and mice, and found that two things uh, really came out of it, is that the fasting mimicking diet and the circadian rhythm fasting are, are the best ones in terms of regulating hormonal cycles and improving brain health. So what is the fasting mimicking diet? A fasting mimicking diet is a diet that's really described uh, by uh, Dr. Walter Longo. Um, 
who uh, is a world expert at looking at fasting states and, and anti-aging and longevity. So the fasting mimicking diet is designed to mimic a fast. So you're still eating, but your body still thinks you're fasting. And the reason is fasting has been shown to clean up your dirty cells in your body. We call that autophagy. After the late stages of fasting, you have a, a period where you start regenerating cells called this upstart regulation of stem cells. So the fasting mimicking diet only lasts for a few days. It's not something that you do forever, but um, it is, we promote it in our clinic once a month to do a fasting mimicking diet to help longevity. So there's a lot more studies that's done on this. There's gonna be 20 more publications on the fasting mimicking diet alone in 2019. And so I'm really forward to looking at that data. So uh, pick one. Uh, honestly, for me, um, the circadian rhythm fasting is, is the most simple. If, there, if I see sunlight outside, I'm going to eat, right? And uh, if there's sun down, then I'll just don't eat. Okay. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'll be the first to tell you, sleep is more important than food when healing the brain. So if someone comes into my office and they have a terrible diet, but they have a horrible sleep schedule, um, I'm going to focus on the sleep first. So why is that? Why is that? So uh, there's a lot more data on sleep and brain health than there is on food and brain health. Um, but impaired sleep makes people crave food, all right? So by dealing with the sleep first, dietary change is so much easier. And not just craving food, they crave cigarettes, they crave sweets, they crave uh, anything that's addictive, that addiction response is significantly more. And so sleep is more important than food, not because it's just a sleep issue, it's because you have a hormonal and neurotransmitter connection, we call a neuroendocrine connection, to have that balance. And so um, a lot of people come to our office and they have a lot of chronic disorders. Uh, they have thyroid issues, they have adrenal issues, they have brain fog, fatigue, and everything like that. And so one of the first things we look for is do you have sleep apnea? And if you do have sleep apnea, we find that you have sleep apnea. I'm not even going to talk about diet first. I want to talk about, we're going to have to fix your sleep apnea. We'll talk about diet later. Because if you have terrible sleep apnea and you hear me talk about diet, it's going to go in one year and come out the other for most people. And, uh, and when people's sleep is under control and, uh, you know, they're not, you know, reading their phones too late at night, they're putting their phones on night mode if they have to look at their phones, they're not watching TV at night, if they have that sort of sleep hygiene, we find that people are far more compliant to any sort of change because they automatically feel better. If you do that, if you, if you have people with sleep hygiene combined with a circadian rhythm diet where they stop eating during the daylight, just those two things alone will improve a lot of these chronic disorders. I already talked about that. Okay. And so the other thing on sleep apnea, actually sleep disorders do increase the risk of stroke. And uh, there's, uh, there's cases where it contributes to actual hemorrhagic stroke. And so <clears throat> why is that? It's because some people with sleep apnea actually have, uh, have uh, blood pressure spikes uh, that may result in either aneurysm ruptures that were previously there or some other issue. And we know that uncontrolled sleep apnea delays brain healing from strokes from multiple studies as well. And so my favorite sleep aids are meditation, and I talked about the whole cell phone thing, uh, turning my, night mode on, uh, using delta wave meditation. You guys know what delta wave meditation is? No? Okay. So your brain has different waves. Um, delta wave is when people go into the deepest state of meditation, they're in that delta wave. It's also uh, phase three of sleep. It's a very deep phase of sleep. And there's frequencies that you, that, uh, that you hear. And um, if you don't believe me, it's on YouTube. <laughs> there's different frequencies that when it, when it comes on, you just like, your brain's like, you just start relaxing. It's called delta wave uh, meditation music. And so um, don't eat up to sundown. That's part of the circadian rhythm diet we talked about. Drink plenty of water throughout the day. Why do you think water helps with sleep throughout the day? Anybody have any idea? Where they're like, well, if you stay more hydrated, maybe you feel better, and then you have more energy throughout the day, and then you sleep at nighttime, right? So water um, is the master detox agent that we have for our body, okay? Without water, we can't detoxify. A lot of environmental toxins come in, and they and uh, when our body is has a lot of sees a lot of these particular toxins, could be pollution, could be chemicals, it could be um, it could be heavy metals, it could be uh, anything that comes into our body that does not do us good. Our body thinks that we're dying, and when we're dying, it shuts off pathways that lets us regenerate. It only and it shuts off metabolism, right? And so you hear a lot of people, oh, you know, I eat like a bird and I don't lose a lot of weight. These are people who have acquired a lot of environmental toxins 
uh, into their body. And, uh, and part of detoxification is drinking lots of water and sleeping. And so really these habits are, are going to improve people's lives, but also it helps us really um, not just manage it, but we can actually reverse chronic disease with these. And then some supplements, there's some supplements that we have is magnesium 3 and 8, uh, melatonin, we also have serine, lavender, and valerian root, and L-theanine, that actually um, sleep aids as well. And then uh, there's other alternative methods, and these are actually studied to have benefit in brain growth and brain recovery, so meditation, tai chi, uh, yoga, brain games, and then of course bonding with your loved ones. So relationships, the better relationship you have, the better your brain is. And uh, I was going to put sex right below there, but I didn't know it was appropriate, but you guys seem cool. So uh, actually, <laughs> actually, um, sex is a very important part of brain regeneration. And this has been studied in multiple instances. And Jenny back here is a mind-body medicine practitioner, so she appreciated the Tai Chi and Qigong part, right? And meditation. And so, oh, that's, I thought I had more slides. Um, so uh, uh, one thing I would do want to mention is that uh, over the last, um, well, we, we, I opened the practice in July of 2017. So since then, we've seen a lot of cases and uh, we have a lot of cool toys and EEGs and all this stuff like that that we do brain mapping on people. We always get people to change how their brain map looks more with diet and lifestyle than any medication we can ever prescribe, ever. And in fact, a lot of medication can deteriorate certain aspects of, of the brain mapping, and we try to get them back by utilizing uh, uh, you know, food as medicine and lifestyle. And so um, over the last probably three months, have, um, we've seen a lot of follow-ups for these brain scans that we did a while ago, and the, the, the dramatic improvements of the way of, that people's brain works has been absolutely fascinating to me. And uh, we're collecting all this data for publication as we speak. Um, but uh, the way that I think uh, medicine is going is that there's a lot of information out there on the internet and to really have to clean up and really understand true evidence base of what's really uh, helping and protecting our brains. And so what the take home message is here is that it's okay to eat dark chocolate if it's organic, a good source, right? It's okay to drink coffee uh, in moderation if it's from a clean source, if you store it properly. Uh, eat the colors of the rainbow, right? That's really, that's really easy to do if you just shop on the periphery of the, of the grocery stores and look in the vegetable aisle, in the fruits aisle, right? Make sure you sleep well. And so um, that's not as easy to do for a lot of people because people get into the habit of doing a lot of stuff at nighttime and, uh, and doing a lot of, and working during the daytime. And then also making sure that um, you have a good relationship with the people that are around you and do not delay on that. That relationship aspect um, affects your sleep, the food that you eat, right? You ever hear people say, oh, you make me eat too much chocolate, you stress me out, right? It affects um, the, the, what your demeanor, affects everything around you. And uh, your brain is so powerful because it's, it's a two-way communication, right? Your brain controls every aspect of you. And everything that you eat, everything that you do also affects your brain. And so in this two-way communication, you have to have a relationship with your brain as well. And so I think overall, um, you know, you guys have been great. And when I lecture to practitioners and physicians, I go into a lot more of the data uh, behind this. But just by letting you know what's in 2019, what we've seen in 2019 in terms of brain data is that uh, a small habit change, like eating during the daytime, produce a significant amount of results that on a lot of the brain data that we see in a span of 24 to 48 hours. It does not take very long. It is it's a fascinating, fascinating thing that we're looking at. So that was it. Any questions? <laughs> Yay, good. How important is the 12-3 fast? The 12-3 fast? Um, in terms of for your brain? So you guys know what the 12-3 fast is? Okay. And so um, the 12 signifies the number of hours, and the 3 signifies don't eat three hours before bedtime. And so, so that's trying to mimic a circadian rhythm diet without saying it's a circadian rhythm diet. So I think it's very important because my favorite is circadian rhythm diet, so I do think that 12-3 is, is, is quite good. Um, now, if you, know, you live in uh, Minnesota versus Houston, 
your daylight eating hours are quite different. <laughs> in Alaska, right? Alaska, you have 24 hours of light in the northern part, right? And so that, in, you know, in those places, the 12-3 is a very fabulous rule to follow. Uh, once again, don't eat three hours before bed and uh, eat about 12 hours window throughout the day. Good question. Yes. Oh, a lot of data on dairy and brain health. Um, there's, there's, uh, so dairy, well, let's, let's talk about cow's milk, okay? So when we, in America, when we say dairy, we're talking about cow's milk. So we know that cow's milk has certain protein that, that are within it that people either tolerate or they don't. Um, so, you know, there's, there's casein. And casein ex exists in many different types. It's alpha and beta and A1 and A2 and, a, a, you know, B1, B2. And so we know... <clears throat> that uh, A1 casein and beta casein uh, has issues with digestion that deplete the phosphorylation of tryptophan, which means that you have a hard time making serotonin, absor absorbing serotonin, or 5-HTP, which turns into serotonin, and that activates your brain. So we know that gut-brain connection is right there, but that doesn't happen with everyone. And so when people do come in and they, they eat um, a ketogenic diet, we take them off of Gluten and dairy, as the, as the one and, two, and gluten and dairy and sugar are the most important portion because of the, those are the biggest culprits in affecting the, the gut brain connection. Um, so you guys heard of A2 milk, right? No. If you go into the grocery store now, you see big things called A2 milk. Uh, A2 milk is actually okay. Um, there's been the, and uh, it's a specifically A2 milk. It's talking about the the A2 subchain of uh, of casein, and so the A2 milk um, could be could be beneficial. Um, and there's actually cows that only produce A2 milk, you know, and a lot of people are getting into. So I think if you want to switch out your milk, switch to A2 milk because it tastes exactly the same. And it's just as versatile as any other milk as well. Um, there is, uh, the other component of dairy is lactose. So people who are lactose intolerant just shouldn't drink milk in general, right? So lactose and, and casein are two different things. Casein is a protein, lactose is, is a sugar. And people who are lactose intolerant uh, and... People who are lactose intolerant get the diarrhea, uh, but that diarrhea also causes gut bacteria to be altered uh, very differently. And so I don't recommend that for anyone who's, who's dairy intolerant. But people have to understand that, yes, I drink milk, I feel good, um, and I'm not, you know, pooping. <laughs> I'm not having diarrhea. It doesn't mean that you're not intolerant to the casein that's in milk. It just means that you're, you're, you're okay with the lactose that's in there. And people develop lactose intolerance. The average age of lactose intolerance onset is, about, is between uh, 25 to 29 years old. Um, so that, that was studied in the Asian population. So I should say Asian people is, 29, is about 29 years old that develop lactose intolerance. And so, uh, and lactose intolerance can go away as well. And so uh, dairy is, is uh, he also heavily associated with type 1 diabetes, okay? Type 1 diabetes is when there's antibodies against your pancreas and you start having deterioration in the pancreas, and uh, it's related to the, to the casein that's in dairy. And so we've had incidences where people were drinking lots of dairy um, with type 1 diabetes. And once they got rid of the dairy, their insulin requirements for, for type 1 diabetes got significantly smaller. So I go on and on about dairy, about so gluten? I'll stop. Huh? Gluten, gluten yeah, gluten is uh, gluten in America. Let's talk about gluten in America, I'm not talk about gluten in other countries. So as I said, gluten is a, is a protein that's in wheat, rye, barley. Uh, but these, the, the gluten that is in America, the gluten at the end of the gluten molecule is this side chain called FODMAPs, okay, full, fermentable oligo di monosaccharides, FODMAPs, okay? And so these, uh, these, these sugar side chains can actually attach, can, can adhere uh, to uh, organophosphates and pesticides and stuff like that, and that can create an issue. And so FODMAPs have been studied with people with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and a lot of gastroenterologists put them on a low FODMAPs diet. And, um, and so the gluten molecule itself, you can also react to. And so there's a whole component and subunits of gluten. There's, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's the gluten molecule, which is broken down into alpha, beta, gamma subunits. There's, there's uh, casomorphine and casomorphone that attaches to that as well, if, which is actually in dairy. So dairy and gluten together conglomerate creates more inflammation than one separately alone. Uh, you can have low molecular weight glutenin, which is another subunit of gluten. So people can actually react to that. And we actually have tests to look for antibodies to test into this 
which can, uh, which can uh, predict gluten sensitivity. And so, but we don't really find an issue in other parts of the country. And I really think is because they're not exposed to pesticides like we are. And so decreased toxic load may increase increased tolerance, right? And so, um, you know, gluten has been, has been you know, in, in public uh, to be a very big enemy, but really it's because of the other components that come with it. So what happens if someone goes gluten-free? If someone goes gluten-free, they stop eating bread, okay? Um, Carl, you remember Wonder Bread, right? Okay. You know what Wonder Bread is made from? It's made from bleach, uh, bleach wheat. And so they literally put chemicals to the wheat grains. And so the bread becomes real cakey. And so by the way, if it's, if it's normal bread, bread is not supposed to be cakey. That, that, that doesn't exist in nature like that. So if you know what Ezekiel bread is, it breaks apart. That's what normal bread is supposed to be like. So the, the cakey type of bread is, uh, is actually stemmed you know, back, uh, I think it was in the 1940s, World War II era, where the Wonder Bread was really popular because at that time, America was, was in a state of famine, right? And so cereal and Wonder Bread were like two awesome things at that time that people can get uh, uh, really cheap calories for. And they have a long shelf life because it's bleach, uh, bleach uh, uh, grains. So, if you ask me more questions, we're going to be here longer. So. If it says gluten-free, does that mean it's good? Because now if they say Cheerios, are gluten-free. Okay. Cheerios technically are not gluten-free. Cheerios actually have one of the highest uh, pesticide contents in, in cereal. Um, so I don't know if you guys know that. So yes, it says gluten-free, but not necessarily just totally gluten-free. There's a limit uh, that you, you, you don't surpass to call it gluten-free. And I'll give you an example. Whipped cream says zero trans fat, okay, because it's 99% air and 1% trans fat, <laughs> okay? And so, uh, I'm not talking about whipped cream, but Cool Whip, Cool Whip is what I'm talking about, Cool Whip. So I squirt that thing on, yeah, 0% trans fat, the rest you're eating is air, right? It didn't meet that threshold to call it a trans fat. And so, and so you're talking about, uh, you know, Cheerios. Um, we know, it's, this has been tested on multiple occasions. It's got, it's got, it's got some, some pesticides in there. Um, so uh, my girls, they have my three and five year old, almost five year old, um, really like uh, some of the, uh, the, 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 the small batch organic O's. It's actually not made from processed grain. So it's one, uh, one thing that they really like to do. And those, those don't, they're, they're party tested. They don't contain, um, they don't contain glyphosate, which is a organophosphate pesticide. There's also gluten-free junk. Um, a lot of gluten-free breads that are real cakey, it tastes delicious. Um, they may be made with other grains that are just as toxic, and, but they also uh, are worse on your blood sugar. So you really gotta be careful about that as well. Yeah, it's all about a balance. You're absolutely right. So, right. and and the thing is, like, when I, when people talk about diets, it's like, well, what's the best diet for me? And my response back is, well, what are your goals in life? Do you want to run a triath triathlon, or you just want to live longer and be prosperous, as we say in Chinese, you know? Or is it that you want you have an autoimmune condition, or you have a lot of chronic pain, or you've had a stroke, you want to regenerate your brain? Like, what is your goal in terms of of diet, right? Um, diet by definition is temporary, right? So I treat it like a temporary thing. So it's like, where do you want to be? Do we want to eat a certain diet till this certain point? We do some blood work, get your inflammatory markers down, do a brain mapping, see if that improves, right? And then where do you want to go after that? It's always a staging when it comes to diet. But overall, just in a healthy population, just keep it balanced, absolutely. And the colors of the rainbows is just such an important thing. Minus Skittles. <laughs> In, yeah, in moderation. Anybody else? Cool, people are hungry, we wanna go, so. Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs> Appreciate it.